Well, for everyone that hasn't been living under a rock for the last week, you already know that Starship flew on its second integrated test flight. That's right, Booster 9 and Ship 25 ascended into the heavens and left behind our favorite view on launch day, which is of course, an empty launch pad. And there's no giant crater this time either, so bonus! We also went up in the air to take a look at the first work SpaceX is undertaking to prepare the pad for the next launch, but that's not all that happened. That's right, in typical SpaceX fashion, work is not stopping, and we had chips and boosters moving around all week. Plus, perhaps the most exciting news besides the launch, there's somehow a second launch tower that's going to be built here? Finally? What's going on? What's up, star fans? I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Surfshark. All right, let's get it out of the way right off the bat. Yes, Starship launched, and so I shaved my beard. But either way, in the lead up to the launch, we had quite a tough week. If you remember from our last Starbase update, we were still waiting on a launch license and Ship 25 had been destacked from Booster 9. Just when we thought everything was ready for launch, they did that destack, they removed the hot staging ring, and it felt like we were never gonna get a launch anytime soon. Then, mercifully, the Fish and Wildlife Service released its biological opinion. The FAA modified the launch license for Flight 2, and SpaceX released a date and time for the launch. At that point, it appeared that everything was go, and there would be no more holdups in the lead up to launch. No more weird snafus, right? Well, we also had another unexpected destack. But at least this time we knew it wasn't going to last, since Elon tweeted confirming that the reason for the D-Stack was to change a grid fin actuator prior to launch. Although it ended up being three actuators instead of one. SpaceX's John Innsprucker, aka The Spruck, said during their webcast that they changed the additional two actuators just as a precaution. Speaking of precautions, here's a quick word about this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Apparently somebody thought it would be funny to replace my order of bacon with vegan bacon, which first off is still delicious, and second, this could have all been prevented if I had secured my internet connection with a VPN. With this video's sponsor, Surfshark VPN, I can. Surfshark is a virtual private network, or VPN, that can help protect you online, and this shark can't be hit by a starship. It allows you to stay safe on public Wi-Fi and gives you extra peace of mind if you're sending or receiving files from somebody. Plus, it can help you connect to sites like your bank for that extra security in case someone wants to mess with your bacon transactions. Get it, bacon? Bacon? Surfshark offers more than 3,200 servers in 100 countries, and you only need one subscription to get the added peace of mind on all of your devices. The app includes pop-up blockers, website safety warnings, and so much more. And now, with Surfshark 1, you get even more security with real-time data breach alerts, antivirus, and a search engine so you can get away from those pesky targeted ads. Not convinced? Well, check out their Black Friday deal. You can get five months of Surfshark for free with Surfshark 1 included. Just head on over to surfshark.deals NSF and enter code NSF. If you don't mind, I've got some vegan bacon to eat and a video to get back to, so. So with the three actuators successfully changed out, which really didn't take much time at all, SpaceX was able to restack the ship atop the booster for the eighth time. That's right, eight times. I almost wish it was nine because so I could do the Ferris Bueller joke, you know, nine times, but really I'm glad that it happened when it happened because holy cow, eight stacks is too many. Either way, with the full stack returned and the clock ticking, we got into the countdown. Propellant load started, the rocket got frosty, and the sun rose, leaving a beautiful morning sky as a backdrop for Starship's second test flight. It's orange! The countdown was pretty dang smooth this time around, and there was only a small hold of less than three minutes to finish filling pressurization bottles on Ship 25. And thankfully, there wasn't a scrub. In fact, it went right on the first try at the top of a tiny little 20 minute window. Pretty impressive. This second launch, compared to the first one, was smooth as butter. All 33 Raptor engines successfully ignited. The rocket leapt off the pad into the morning sky, and there was no concrete ejected. But perhaps best of all, thanks to those clean burning engines as opposed to the exploding engines last time, we got to see some seriously massive shock diamonds. I mean, 
Just look at this. They're huge. They're mind blowing. They're the world's biggest shock diamonds. Oh my gosh, what a sight to behold. I mean, what else is there to say? It was utterly amazing and truly beautiful. And I guess I don't need to tell you, but I will anyways, that you can get shots like this as a metal print for your wall. And the best part is, part of your contribution to buying that metal print goes to the photographer that took the print. And we seriously appreciate it as we work to cover the expenses that we incur on these launches. You can see in this shot from Max, the ultra mega diamonds. And there's also slow-mo footage of Ascent from Mary and I that we were able to publish in another standalone video in 4K. Plus also an amazing shot of ignition from Sean. While Starship's first flight was a total mess on the way uphill and the rocket lost control, this time, everything went perfectly well and all 33 engines fired and the vehicle reached staging at the height and speeds expected for it. Then, of course, we got to the hot staging maneuver, which was also amazing and also incredibly beautiful. And I can't believe it worked successfully on its first try. The booster shut down 30 of its engines, the ship ignited its six engines, it separated successfully, and that's basically what you'd expect from a successful hot staging. I still can't get over the shutdown sequence for the booster's engines. It's yet another insanely beautiful thing on top of all the other insanely beautiful things we got to see on this launch. After hot staging, the booster flipped and initiated its boost back burn, but it was unfortunately lost during that burn. It would appear that the engines did not like having to relight, or something. Some may have even exploded, and other engines that were already lit then shut down. Sean was surmising that it might have been a propellant loss issue, which would hopefully be an easy fix. Either way, we're not exactly sure why the booster exploded, and we can't be sure until SpaceX releases more information, so we'll just have to be patient and see what they say. In any case, the booster did great on ascent, so a rut after staging is not a big deal for now. Booster recovery is obviously very important, but for the time being, SpaceX is 100% focused on getting the ship to Hawaii. They'll deal with booster recovery later down the line, and thanks to their fantastic work with Falcon 9, I have no question that it'll get sorted out in due time. Of course, as part of that successful hot staging, we had Ship 25 igniting all six of its engines and then powering its way into an orbital-ish trajectory. For the first time, we can say that we had a Starship well above the McDowell line and in space. Truly amazing. The ship's burn went well pretty much for the whole duration, except for the last 30 seconds. Just a half a minute before it was supposed to end the burn, and when it was almost at orbital speeds, the graphics telemetry showed the engines shutting down, and then we saw what appeared to be an explosion. SpaceX quickly confirmed that Ship 25's automated flight termination system was triggered near the end of the burn. This was a bit of a bummer, as it was really close to finishing that burn, but either way, SpaceX will have a ton of data to go through now, after what was a very successful flight. And you know what I always say, more data, more better. And don't fret, I'm sure we'll have many more videos that give a much more in-depth play-by-play -play of everything we saw on launch day, but this is just our initial impressions and what we could see with our eyes at the time. Now, of course, prior to and after the launch, a lot of things had been going on at Starbase that I think are rather important to talk about, especially because now begins the job to prepare Booster 10 and Ship 28 for their own static fire test campaigns ahead of Starship's third flight. Also, Starbase is quite busy preparing the vehicles that are coming down the line right after that for flights 4, 5, and so on. So we obviously had to get in the plane, fly around, and take an aerial view of SpaceX's sites across South Texas. Starting off with the Massey Outpost, we have what appears to be a tank farm expansion at this location. You can see here a new tank and new subcoolers have been added compared to when we last flew. We don't really know what they're going to do here, but this is quite an interesting development and we'll definitely keep an eye on it in the future. Also, you might notice Booster 11 is no longer on its thrust simulator stand. The booster was rolled back from Massey Outpost all the way back to the Mega Bay just a day after launch and got lifted onto the engine installation stand inside of the Mega Bay. You can see on our aerial shots, Booster 11 is already installed onto that white stand and Hopefully, in the next few days and weeks, it'll receive its engines and get ready for its own static fire test campaign. We say it's an engine stand, but I guess it's more like a general workstation stand, since the booster not only gets its engines here, but also other kinds of hardware on the outside and inside of it. Next up, at the Sanchez lot, we had quite an interesting development. You might not see it at first, but if you zoom in, yep, that's right, those are launch tower segments. But these are not just for any level of such a tower, Therefore, the top levels of a Starship tower. Now, from our KSC flyovers, you might remember that SpaceX had partially built a set of launch tower sections that hadn't been worked on for quite a while. 
This disused tower already had seven sections completed, with pieces for the top two sections still left in pieces in the form of columns and beams. Could it be that these pieces at Starbase are the leftover pieces from Roberts Road? Well, if we look at this picture from one of our last KSC flyovers, we can correlate the pieces to the ones seen here at Starbase. We have these columns here, some beams over there in the background, these four boxes, and then we have this little piece hiding behind one of the tower sections. That little piece in particular is the one on the top level that holds the beams that house the pulleys for the tower carriage system. All of these pieces seen here can also now be seen at Sanchez. Now, since we haven't flown over KSC in a little bit, don't worry, we're gonna do one soon. We had to ask our friend, Harry Stranger, so he could get his eyes in the sky. Harry got from Umbra Space two synthetic aperture radar images, or SAR images, of Roberts Road. This technique basically sweeps a radar across the location. The radar signal comes back to the satellite, and after a lot of complicated processing, you get this view. Now, it's not an image per se, as it's not in visible wavelength, but you can see what objects are in the picture. If we compare a view from October 6th to November 20th, you can see that the columns were there back in October, but they're not there in the November picture. You can even make out the four little boxes here as well that also go away in the November picture. So this kind of gives us a clear view that these pieces are most likely the same ones since they've disappeared from Roberts Road. So this of course seems to mean that SpaceX is gearing up to build a second launch tower here in Starbase. But as you can see from our shots in the air, it's a little bit up in the air as to when that'll happen, as there is no current location that is obvious for this second tower. So SpaceX will have to do some work clearing and preparing an area for this tower to go. Where will it go? Your guess is as good as mine. We may see the remaining tower sections already built at Roberts Road potentially coming here to Starbase as well, and perhaps even the chopsticks and carriage system that were also built at KSC may move in the near future. Another potential change coming up at Starbase might be related to another piece of hardware that we can see at the Sanchez lot. The nose cone over here is theorized to be Ship 33's nose cone, and as you can see, it's definitely not looking like it'll fly anytime soon. Its tiles have been removed, the steel is bent, and it's basically scrap at this point. The curious thing is that in previous occasions, when nose cones were scrapped, the flaps were removed and reused on later vehicles, but this time around, they're being scrapped along with the nose cone. Now, one theory as to why this has happened is that SpaceX will skip Ship 33 and Ship 34 in a similar manner that they skipped Ship 17, 18, and 19 in the past. Why would they skip ships? Well, maybe Ship 35 and beyond will finally have a redesigned nose cone and maybe even redesigned flaps. I'm sure you might remember Elon talking about this potential design change all the way back in 2021. And now maybe, just maybe, we're seeing the first hints of this happening. Maybe. Either way, we'll keep our eyes on it to see what happens. Next up at the production site, we had quite a shuffling of vehicles. In fact, we had a vehicle shuffled today with Ship 30. Ship 31 left the high bay and is now at the Rocket Garden, while Ship 29, which was at the Rocket Garden, is now back at the high bay, right where Ship 31 had been located. A potential reason to move Ship 29 here might be to implement some of the upgrades that we've seen on Ship 28, 30, and 31, but that had not yet been implemented on 29. Ship 31 might be finished enough to finally leave some space for 29, so crews are able to work on it inside the high bay. In the time since we last flew, we also now have Ship 32 finally fully stacked, and it should be nearing completion in the next few weeks. With Ship 33's nose cone having been scrapped and the theory of potentially skipping 33 and 34 in place, this might be the last Starship we see built for a little bit of time, so enjoy it while it lasts. From the air, we can also see Booster 10 tucked away inside the back corner of the Mega Bay. Then, closer to the entrance is Booster 12. In the last few weeks, Booster 12 received its CO2 purge tanks, and there are already covers on top of them to form the chines, as you can see in this picture. We've also seen SpaceX move one of the black rings that was at Sanchez here to the production site. And given the fact that this ring only features hold downs for boosters, it may very well be that this is just a glorified and more advanced booster transport stand. We'll have to wait and see how it all comes into action. Maybe Booster 10 will end up using it soon. Who knows? And of course, from the air, the launch site views tell a great story. Other than some burnt metal and some cracked fondag around the orbital launch mount, the whole place is in far better shape after Flight 2 than it was after Flight 1. 
You can see here, for example, part of the metal roof of this container has been bent a bit. Frankly, that's far better than all the concrete chunks thrown around after Flight 1. We also have a buckle on one of the water tanks at the tank farm, so that's another piece of damage from the second flight. And then, on the quick disconnect arm, the umbilicals have also been bent just a bit. These things will obviously need to be fixed for the third flight, but I bet all this takes just a few weeks to correct, and maybe they'll think of ways to protect these parts from the fury of all 33 Raptor engines on Super Heavy. After all, the best way to know the weakest protection points of the launch site is to actually figure out what broke from a launch and reinforce those places. On Flight 1, the rocket made a crater under the orbital launch mount, and the whole foundation was reinforced and the water deluge was installed. That's pretty much how they solve things at SpaceX. Now these aerial views are from a few days after launch, but we actually went down to the launch site and shot pictures and video three hours after liftoff, which is insane. Everything looked so much better compared to Flight 1, as it took days for us to be able to go down to the pad because of the damage that had been done, compared to just the three hours after Flight 2. And that really says it all in terms of how the launch pad fared. We were able to access the launch site so quickly after the launch that the booster QD was still showing signs of condensation from the cryogenics it had delivered to booster 9. As you can see, these ground shots tell a very similar story as the shots from the air. We saw SpaceX crews walking around the pad, looking carefully at all of the hardware and assessing the status of the place. Elon later tweeted that the launch pad was in great condition and the water-cooled steel plate wouldn't need any refurbishment ahead of the next launch. Now, obviously, other parts of the launch site will need refurbishment, and we've seen crews quickly coming back to work on them. Now, say it with me, work continues on the orbital launch mount. That's right, scaffolding has returned to the OLM, and crews will likely take a little bit to inspect and refurbish everything there for the next flight. And so, when will that next flight take place? Well, Elon, optimistic as ever, said it would take about three to four weeks, aka before the end of the year, and it would certainly be one heck of a New Year's firework. But I think it's more likely to take place in the first half of 2024, maybe February or early March. Either way, we'll definitely see Booster 10 and Ship 28 coming to the launch site soon, and I say before the end of the year, but it'll take a bit before both have completed testing and are ready to go. We also have the paperwork side of things, as the FAA has initiated, as expected, a mishap investigation due to the loss of vehicles during Starship's second flight. So suffice to say that everything with Flight 2 went so well that we don't expect SpaceX to need to do any sort of major refurbishments or changes to the launch pad ahead of Flight 3. And that means that turnaround time should condense quite a bit. Again, I think Flight 3 is likely to take place early next year, maybe February or early March. But really, who knows? Let us know what you think in the comments when you think Flight 3 will be. Thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Check out their Black Friday deal. You can get five months of Surfshark for free with Surfshark 1 included. Just go to surfshark.deals NSF and use code NSF or click the link in the description. All right, that's it for this week. We'll see you in the next Starbase update. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other. Also, check out my mustache. Huh? Handlebars? Yes? No? What do you think? Let us know in the comments.